In yet another small step in the new moon race between China, Russia and the United States, the Chinese have launched their most ambitious mission to the moon yet. The Chang'e 4 spacecraft was originally developed as a backup to the Chang'e 3 and has now been refurbished with some additional instruments and was launched from the Saigon Satellite Center on December 7, 2018. In the same vein as the old Soviet Union of the Cold War days, Chang'e 4 was not even broadcast live officially on the Chinese television. The only light streaming of the launch was via a group of spectators who managed to sneak into the launch facility. The Chang'e 4 entered lunar orbit on December 12th and is scheduled to land on the moon on January 3rd, 2019. It may have already been landed by the time you are watching this video. Rather than just being a repeat of the Chang'e 3 mission, the Chang'e 4 will attempt something that has never been done before. The moon is tidally locked with the Earth meaning that the time it takes to make a complete orbit around the Earth is also the same amount of time it takes to make a full rotation. Subsequently, only one side of the Moon is always facing the Earth. This hemisphere is referred to as the near side, the side nearest to the Earth. All past landings on the Moon, i.e. the unmanned surveyor missions, Ranger, the Soviet Union missions, and even the previous Chinese mission were all on the near side of the Moon, the side that always faces the Earth. Chang'e 4, on the other hand, will attempt to land on the far side of the moon, the side never seen from the Earth. This obviously presents a challenge, because radio contact is done by a line of sight. The transmitter and receiver must both be in line of sight. This is not possible on the far side of the moon because... Well, you've got the moon in the way blocking the signal. In order to communicate with the Chang'e 4, the Chinese launched the Kuwaito satellite to the Earth-Moon Lagrange Point 2, or L2 point, specifically to act as a relay satellite between Chang'e 4 and China. The mission will include many of the same instruments previously carried on Chang'e 3, along with a few new experiments. Of particular interest is a 3kg biological payload of potatoes, Arabidopsis thaliana plants and silkworm eggs. The capsule will essentially be a miniature ecosystem. If the eggs hatch, they will feed on the potatoes. Their carbon dioxide and waste products will in turn feed the plants, providing more food and oxygen for the insects. The Chinese even plan on televising these lifeforms from the moon. If successful, this will be the third time that lifeforms have been sent to the moon. The first two times being the Soviet Zonda 5 and Zond 6 missions. Before any propagandist wants to cite the survival of these lifeforms as evidence that humans can survive the radiation on a flight to the moon, I'd like to point out that as was the case with Zond, the Chang'e 4 is yet another extremophiles mission. As explained in a previous video, extremophiles are plants, animals or microbes that harmlessly thrive in environments too extreme for humans to withstand. There are species that can harmlessly live in toxic environments. There are species that can live in environments too hot or too cold. There are even lifeforms that can live in the vacuum of space. Likewise, there are lifeforms that can harmlessly absorb huge amounts of radiation. The lifeforms carried aboard Zonda 5, for example, consisted of turtles, wineflies, mealworms, bacteria, and spiderwort plants, all of which are capable of withstanding huge amounts of radiation that would be lethal to humans. Turtles, for example, have a special radiation-fighting amino acid in their blood that is believed could be used to cure radiation sickness in humans. And spiderwort plants are sometimes referred to as living Geiger counters, as the only effects of high radiation exposure are colour changes in their stigmas. We also established in that previous video that the human body would be much more susceptible to radiation than these lifeforms because of their bulk. The 8 grams per square centimetre of shielding attributed to Apollo would only attenuate protons with energies up to 8 mega electron volts, while the human body would be able to absorb protons with energies on the order of several hundreds of mega electron volts. That's because the energy range of protons in the Van Allen belt and solar flares overlap that of protons used in proton therapy and proton-computed tomography. 
Medics only accelerate the protons into energy sufficient enough to penetrate as far as the tumour they are targeting. For example, a 200 MeV proton can penetrate up to 25.8 centimetres of soft human flesh, equivalent to penetrating a human skull. And a 250 MeV proton will penetrate up to 37.7 centimetres of soft human flesh. Turtles, plants, insects and especially bacteria are considerably smaller and less bulky than humans. Thus, the high energy protons are more likely to pass clean through these tiny creatures and deposit little energy in their bodies. Zonda 6 also carried a biological payload, also consisting of much of the same extremophiles. However, all life forms aboard died when the Zonda 6 crashed to the Earth, regardless of whether or not they survived the radiation on the flight. Now we come to the Chang'e 4. Again, extremophiles. For example, Tolbert and Pearson reported in their 1952 paper, Atomic Energy in the Plant Species, that potatoes are quite hardy against radiation. Potatoes have been used to study the effects of acute doses of X-rays and fast neutrons, and of continuous chronic gamma irradiation from cobalt-60 upon germination and growth of plants. For the potato tuber, various dosages of radiation to the tuber before planting resulted in a decrease in the yield. Continuous gamma radiation at equivalent levels had no adverse effect on growth. Tubers were cut into seed pieces and given X-ray dosages before planting, from 75 rentgens to 38,400 rentgens. The date of emergence and consequently height of young plants were adversely affected by 300 rentgens or higher. Yield was significantly reduced by 1,200 rentgens, and 4,800 rentgens was near the lethal dose. For direct comparison, the rentgen equivalent in man for 300 rentgens is about 263 rem. This is lethal to humans if received over minutes to hours, while spread out over a lifetime would lead to health problems. But in the case of potato plants, it only affects their height. Likewise, 1200 rentgens to 4800 rentgens are equal to over 1000 rem and 4000 rem respectively. This is an indisputably lethal dose to humans, while in the case of potatoes, only the latter is close to lethal. So, what about the other life forms? In 2010, Kurimoto et al. published a study in the Journal of Health Physics specifically establishing the effects of ionizing radiation on Aridopsis thaliana. They exposed samples of these plants to 6 MeV X-rays at different dose intervals of 0.5 gray, 5 gray, 50 gray, and 150 gray. In human equivalents, that's equal to between 50 rem, 500 rem, 5000 rem, and 15000 rem. Such doses are lethal to humans within short time frames. For direct comparison, the legendary solar flare of August 1972 only produced 5,300 rem from 30 MeV protons. Such a dose falls within the higher end of the range of X-ray doses used by Kurimoto's experiment, and no one doubts that this flare would have killed an astronaut had they been on a mission to the moon at the time. But in the case of these plants, the authors clearly state All 750 samples survived the immediate consequences of ionizing radiation and eventually flowered and completed their life cycle. However, seed viability of the second generation was not examined. In other words, they didn't plant the seeds of these irradiated plants to see if their offspring grew healthily. Nonetheless, it still demonstrates that Aridopsis thaliana are hardy enough to survive the Chang'e 4 mission, and the survivability of such hardy plants says nothing about humans being able to survive. Their paper also refers to a couple of past studies done in the 1970s and 1990s on these plants that yielded the same results. And as established in my previous video, insects such as silkworms carried aboard the Chang'e 4 can withstand in excess of 5,000 rad. So if the lifeforms aboard Chang'e 4 survive, and any propagandist tries to cite their survival as evidence that humans can survive the radiation on a flight to the moon, it is clear that these propagandists are again comparing apples with oranges and complaining that their apple doesn't taste like an orange. Just that I point that out to you guys to save yourselves the embarrassment. No need to thank me.